May our words be found in yours, and may your word be always found in us, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. What would stewardship season be without the story of the widow and her two mites? She's the hero of the life of generosity. She gave more than the rest, even though technically they gave more than she did. And of course, she has always been a hero for the church. And this morning, we are treated to the story of another widow, Ruth, a Moabite woman, who after her husband died, learned to live again and worked through her sorrow to find a new life and went on to be the great-grandmother of King David and an ancestor of Christ himself. Both of them in their widowhood were examples of strong women who have become heroes of our faith. So this morning, I want to think about three stories of widows that I have known. The first is a woman named Jane Wilson. You don't know her, but she was an alumna of Wellesley College just down the road. And one day, she was taking the train from Boston back to New Jersey, where she was from, when a charming, slow-talking young man who went to Harvard, offered to carry her suitcases, and then persuaded her eventually that she should take the train with him all the way back to Georgia, where he was from. Now, by the time that I knew her, they had been married for over 50 years when he died, and she was the pecan queen. <laughs> the two of them had made a fortune selling pecans. He was the sweet-talking, charming executive, and she was the smart-mouth Yankee. <laughs> and as she told me, he went to Harvard, which meant somebody had to be the brains in the operation. <laughs> well, after he died, she decided that she was going to spend the rest of her life giving away as much as she could and give it away she did. It took the two of them a lifetime to create that kind of wealth, and she would only have a decade or so to give it all away. When we were building a new church, she told me she wanted to give something, which I thought might be five, maybe $10,000 if we were fortunate. Instead, she bought us a new organ. That was the kind of thing she liked to do. And what impressed me about her kind of giving was that she didn't have to give. To us or to anyone, people would have understood if she simply kept it safely to herself. But hers was a frivolous generosity. In listening to her stories, I noticed why she did what she had done. All of her life, people had shaped her and had given to her in different kinds of ways, so much that she didn't see any alternative except to give frivolously and generously. And it's true that she had a lot to give, but it's also true that she chose to give to churches and schools and universities, to the Boys and Girls Club, to build a hospice house for the very poor who were dying, and in all of that, she taught me a wonderful lesson. People in our lives have taught us to be generous if only we listen to those stories. Like the widow of Mark's gospel, they didn't have to give, but they gave of whatever they had. Our lives, I suspect, are full of those stories if only we listen to them. That leads me to the second story that I want to share. It's a personal one. It's a story of how generosity was shaped in my own family. 
Back in the 1950s, when my father was only five years old, on a normal Saturday morning, tragedy struck their family. My grandfather had a friend who delivered gasoline to gas stations, and sometimes when there was more gasoline to be delivered than time to deliver it, he would go out and pitch in. He was a bookkeeper, and he loved driving the gasoline truck. <laughs> well, he was at a Shell station that fateful morning, and somebody tossed a cigarette butt out the window of their car, and there was a huge explosion, and it almost killed my grandfather. In fact, it left him in the hospital for over a year. During that year, he left behind a wife and five children. Now, I can't say exactly how rich they were before the accident. My father remembers that they were playing rock school outside when the phone rang to say that he had been in this terrible accident. And I can only surmise that children who play with rocks are not exactly wealthy. <laughs> but after the accident, they were poor. For the next year, they were terribly poor. Of five children, two of them were in college, and the other three were in elementary school. My grandmother, rest her soul, was not exactly a widow. In some ways, it was a little bit worse, if I could say that. She had to care for a husband in the ICU for a year, as well as children in elementary school and college. I'm sure that there were many days when she was putting her last two coins into the temple treasury. I'm sure there were days she didn't know how she was going to do it. Ironically, that's not the story that my father and his brothers and sisters tell when they tell this story. They always talk about generosity. They talk about a friend of my grandmother who stepped in and paid for my uncle to stay in college. He didn't have children himself, so he said this was his opportunity to do something like that. They talk about a childhood friend of my grandfather who anonymously sent checks to the state teacher's college so that my aunt could stay in school. Every month, the anonymous check showed up. Finally, they figured out who he was, and so they wanted to thank him in some grand way. And he sent them back a simple letter that said, no thank you. It is what decent people do in a situation like this. The end. My great aunt and uncle took my father to live with them for a year. They treated him as if he were their own. Now that I have children, I suspect they treated him better than they would have treated their own. <laughs> he spent all of first grade with them. And from all of that, this is what I've learned about generosity. If you ask them about tragedy and their poorness, the talk quickly turns to all the people who brought food, and money, and paid the mortgage, that list is much longer and much more glorious. And all of that is what my father tried to teach me about stewardship when I was growing up. He had a very intentional way of giving, of giving to the work of God all around us. He always gave 10% of everything that he made away. And there were days when he would show me the checks that, honestly, I'll tell you, I didn't really like it. I was a teenager. How could I have appreciated what he was doing? But through all of that, I learned to appreciate his disciplined generosity. Every time, he would remind us of how people gave to his family when all the cards were stacked against them when they were ready to eat their last piece of bread and die. And he had never forgotten that. And he was convinced because of it, that was the kind of people God wanted us to be. No widow should ever have to give her last two coins when we had so much. 
That brings me to my final story. It was stewardship season a few years ago, and I was preaching, of course, on this text. But you see, there's something about this text that really bothers me. We've always held up the widow and her two coins as a hero of our church, of all that we should be. When in fact, if you look at this story, I suspect we're a lot more like the scribes than we are like the widow. Mark's gospel says that they wear nice clothes, that they do respectable things, that they give out of their abundance, nothing wrong with all of that. Jesus' lesson is not that there's anything wrong with them per se, but that we should not fool ourselves into thinking that God doesn't see the widow and what she gives. God always sees the intent of our hearts. And so because of that, we must care for those who run the risk of giving more than they can give. Now, I went on to say that I thought the story of the widow giving her last two mites was a tragedy. In the Greek sense of comedy and tragedy, that's what Jesus meant when he pointed her out, that she shouldn't have had to give the last that she had when there were scribes like us who could give for her, who could have given frivolously or even with a simple disciplined generosity. And Jesus pointed her out so that you and I would recognize her and never let this tragedy happen again. Well, it was then that I was approached by a merry band of widows. And they told me exactly where I could put my tragedy. (laughs) This was their story, even if it had been claimed by the church from time immemorial. They loved baking bread and caring for people with all they had and giving whatever they could, large or small, because this story had convinced them that God saw what they gave, that God saw them and their hearts, and God loved them. God knew, thank you very much, Father Tragedy. (laughs) They were right, of course. I told you, Jane Wilson, the Wellesley alumna that I knew, she gave us an organ for the new church. Well, I should mention that given our gospel reading for today, it wasn't the largest donation that we received. The largest was from another woman, a blue-collar woman who grew up not too far from here in Lowell. I'll never forget the day that I opened her commitment to build the new church. It was for $9 a month over the course of five years for a total of $500. I knew, as you know, that was the largest donation that we got. And in fact, she would want me to tell you she gave $10 each month and she ended up meeting and surpassing her own pledge. I've learned not to be surprised by those kinds of things. That was the type of generosity that Jesus passed on to us. If I may say, I was not surprised when I first got here to Good Shepherd that the first two large donations that we received as a church outside of regular stewardship were, of course, from two widows. That seems to be their way. I wasn't surprised this summer when I was asked to do a funeral for a family who couldn't afford to do a funeral, but they wanted, beyond all hope, to have a lovely funeral for their 24-year-old son. And I told them that Good Shepherd would be honored to do it The young man had gone to Newton North High School and died only six years after graduating. And all of his friends, 50 or 60 of them, gathered in this church to mourn his loss. And they all pooled their money together so that they could give something to us in memory of him. 
I think it was about $500, $3, $4, $10 at a time. This was their story too. This summer, when we were working at Be Safe downtown at the church called St. Augustine and Martin, we would take people with us every day to go and to feed. And one day I had this great idea that we were going to lead children's worship with Kinder Eggs. And so I took Ella and I took one of her friends, a young man who had just finished the first grade. And he was great. And he helped and he played with the other children. And when we got back, we were getting out of the car right here in the Good Shepherd driveway. And he said, before you go, I'd like to make a donation to the church where we were. And I said, okay. This little boy wasn't so bad after all, <laughs> following around my daughter. <laughs> and he opened up his wallet and he pulled out a dollar. And he gave it to me and he said, I want you to make sure that the people at that church receive this donation. And I told him that I would. And he said, no, no, I can do better. And he gave me another dollar. Two dollars, he said, that's all I have. Make sure that they get it. Amen. Amen.